Hey, everybody. I just have so many feels right now because of Ed's talk, so I just want to say that was amazing. <laughs> really great job. Uh, my name is Robin Hunnicky, and I am a game designer and a producer and the co-founder of an independent studio in San Francisco called Phenomena. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and I'm here today to talk to you about caring. Um, I'm a gamer, and I played games my whole life, all kinds of games. Um, they scared me, and they thrilled me, and they entertained me through college and into grad school. And I fell in love with games. I love thinking about how they work, what makes them tick, and what makes them fun. And I know that all of you love this too, because really, you have to. To be in our industry, you have to like playing the long game. Games do make the headlines, and they even make money. But when you look at growth-oriented businesses, say Facebook, $523 million in profit on sales of $2.6 billion in one quarter this year, last year. Google, $3.38 billion in profits last quarter. Uh, ExxonMobil even tumbling to $8.35 billion in this last quarter. We've got room to grow. Our industry is rocky often, but we stay in the game. And I don't care who you work for or what your game is about, it takes heart. And I like working with passionate video game romantics. It's a thrill to be on stage and talk to all of you. But I'm gonna be honest, I wasn't really sure when I left my PhD program in the 2000s to join the games industry as a full-time commercial developer, if it was the place for me. I was really into thinking about games as simulation and robots, obviously, and the dream of intelligent machines. Um, and I didn't know if my interests were compatible with commercial game software. And luckily, like Ed, I got found. I got found by The Sims, Will Wright. And I ended up being able to see that our industry, from the inside, actually, wasn't nearly as narrow as I had perceived from the outside as a fan and as a gamer. And I began to focus on making casual games, that's what we called them, for a broader audience, like around 2005, I remember all that, um, that were sort of about creativity and they were nonviolent. And um, they put a lot of thought into their mechanics. They wanted to be really juicy and to give players new experiences for new consoles, new modes of interaction. And over the years, as I continued to develop games and meet new colleagues and move through my career, I realized that actually the industry was becoming a place for people exactly like me. Uh, experimental games uh, were becoming celebrated. Um, many of you will remember, Genova was here last year. He read a beautiful letter that we got from a fan um, who had had a really lovely experience playing Journey with her father, who then passed away. And it was amazing, and we got so many letters. Uh, and it stuns me to think about how many games, or how, sorry, how many players this game touched, you know, uh, since we released it in the spring of 2012. How did it happen? What made the game so successful? being so small and relatively unique. Why did people like it? And why did our peers like it? I think it comes back to this. We spent a lot of time on Journey thinking about the people who were gonna play our game. And specifically, the experience they were gonna have. Like Tripp said earlier, we wanted it to be genuine and authentic. We wanted it to provide real value. What does that mean? I think it means caring about the way people are going to experience your game. Caring about the people who play it. It means that instead of thinking about them as eyeballs, or as downloads and installs, or even a walking wallet, you're thinking about that person, that customer, as people. People like you maybe even your friends and family. In this act, I believe we are only limited by our imagination, our ability to envision those people as people who we want to genuinely care about. And I would like to argue that when you look at the games that people talk about in a landscape right now, games like Broken Age from Double Fine, or Octodad from Young Horses, 
or even League of Legends, what you will see is that games made by people who care about people are the ones that people talk about. They're the ones that go viral. They're the ones that have huge market successes out of scale with their marketing budgets, their development teams, or even what their competitors have done more successfully in the past. I believe that if you spend time really caring about your players, you get this amazing super tool which helps you in all situations in game development. And there are many situations in game development. That tool is empathy. I know that sounds creepy, so we'll talk about it like the values slide. Everybody wants to get to this place where the work that they're doing takes their game to this place. It takes you to a place where you provide value to your customer without taxing yourself, your team, or your business. I believe that that value is best reached with the divining rod called empathy. And I think that by putting yourself inside of your player and seeing the game through their giant eyes, you are able to make the right decision at every step. This is the feeling-focused game development team. It's the kinder, gentler way to think about your customer. I can't speak to your experiences as developers, and many of you are much more successful than I could ever dream to be. But what I can tell you is that I founded a company specifically with my friend Martin to try and do this, to try and think of players as people. Martin is amazing, he's a really good friend, he reminds me to make every day count. I really value him for his values. And our explicit goal when we started the company was to start off trying to make a big idea, some big game, that we could you know, reach people with. But then we also wanted to work on some little ideas, small things, and then at the bottom, to give back, to ground the company in every hire that we made in wanting to give back 20% time. You know, copy the big guys, right? Copy Google. We thought it sounded pretty smart. And we wanted to work with cool people, so we started talking to my friend Keita Takahashi, who made this amazing game, Katamari, which is my favorite game of all time. Specifically, because Keita has this immense, and what I find to be contagious, interest in childhood and play. His work focuses on the scale of things and how we used to look at things when we were younger. And we're working with him on a game that occurred to him while he was playing with his son. Ostensibly, this game is about the people that you've been seeing in my talk so far, the mayor and two deputies. Um, but the longer that we work on it, what I'm realizing is this game is actually about people. It's about people of all shapes and sizes learning to connect with one another in order to make the world a better place, to have fun together. And in many ways, it's about when you learn to care about other people and see them as being like you, that you have a better time in life. Uh, you're less concerned with some of the things that we think about as being grown up and think a little bit more like a child. And this comes from Kata and from working with him. And what I found is that working on this game is actually making us all better people. Um, it helps us connect genuinely with ourselves and the people in our lives. And this idea is actually coming on the back end through the project that we're doing to give back, which is really strange to me. I didn't expect it, but we're working on this game called Terra, which is a collaboration with the NSF and UC Davis. And this is the very first prototype I made with meeples and modded Carcassonne tiles. Um, and as we worked on it, just kind of game jam style, bootstrapping, um, we decided that we would want this game to take data from a Fitbit and that kids could use the Fitbit as power to move through the game. Um, because kids in schools in our country don't necessarily have access to fancy tech, at least not all of them, we made it a web-based game. And we really focused on this feeling of exploration, exploring the tiles. That's my amazing art in there. Our idea was to develop the game so that um, exploring the world made it easier to customize and develop your base. Does that ring a bell? We would explore to find land and terraform and harvest food and orin creatures and then expand the colony as a whole. I found this game, or this game found me, when I was in seventh grade, which is the same age of the kids that we work with. And working on this game has made me think a lot about that person I was then. I don't know if you remember what it's like to be in seventh grade, but you have so much energy to make decisions and the will to change things. 
but your life is still very much structured like it was when you were a young child, and it can be very frustrating. And in a way, working on this project has given me a chance to go back in time and kind of save middle school for myself, to go back and make it a little bit more interesting, even if it's just for a couple of schools, to show them that there's a whole world out there. And also to communicate something that I think we've all learned as adults, which is that life is about choices. It's about making choices and exploring the landscape of your choices and looking at the contour of those choices so that you can make better decisions for yourself in the future, so that you can design a better life. You iterate towards success. And this is one of the things that I didn't expect, actually, about working on this project. It's allowed me to go back in time and think about how I felt, make peace with it, and then grow from that and think about childhood and the choices that we have when we're young and how they affect us when we get older. That feeds into the middle part, which is one of the little ideas that I'm doing research on in my spare time. It's very much influenced by people who I know or who I've read about who have survived a trauma or a challenge, something really difficult. I find these people really inspiring because what they do is they transform from trauma. They integrate negative experiences so they can learn from the darkest moments in their lives. A game about transformation, for, and it's say integration, instead of getting revenge or going back in time and making it not happen is something that I find really compelling. You can't go back in time and take away pain, but you can learn from it and grow. And maybe this idea will appeal to other people that I know, and maybe because they find it appealing, other people who they know who've had this experience or who have shared it with a loved one or a family member will also like it. What does that have to do with you? I believe that as developers, we all have the practice of stepping outside of ourselves whenever we test a game for usability. This is the empathy muscle, and it's one that we all share because you have to do it, otherwise your game isn't playable. And perhaps you're already caring about people like you. Maybe you're making a game for people just like you, players like you. But I believe that if you build your empathy muscles, you can reach people genuinely who are not like you. And maybe you can even evangelize something to them without talking about features or the minutia of a specific genre or worrying about paid downloads and so forth. I believe that if you want to appeal to people on a broad level, that you should appeal to something deeper than the level of mechanics feeling, the feeling of falling in love, the feeling of spending time with someone who you learn to trust, processing the loss of a loved one. While this isn't the point of this very brief talk, it is important to realize that the model is sustainable, and when you start to look for it, you will see it everywhere. In games like Gone Home, which is in some ways about learning more about the people that we love, in a game like Walking Dead, which is about helping someone who needs to be protected. Or The Last of Us, which is in a way about being saved by someone you thought you were saving. You can read this same sentiment in a lot of places. Here's one that I found recently. Products that meet this high standard are virtually always grounded in a deep and profound understanding of the customer it rarely happens by chance. In my experience, startups who don't get this message drift from one solution to another, never getting traction that they need. And large companies who focus on features rather than on real value end up looking like their competitors in an endless cycle of non-innovation. There is a landscape of people out there right now who do not identify themselves as gamers. By connecting with them genuinely, you can find new players, and maybe you'll be inspired to make some new games. As a gamer, I think that would make the world a super awesome place. Why not try it? Thank you. <laughs>